This conference will now be recorded. Good morning. Welcome to AI Answers, weekly updates and answers from the world's leading valuation authority. My name is Bill Garber. I'm a director of government and external relations for the Appraisal Institute. It is July 1st, 2020. And with us today is Casey Conway, the director of research and corporate engagement for the Alabama Center of Real Estate and the chief economist for the CCIM Institute. It's been quite a year. I think uh, this marks the halfway point for 2020. Uh, it feels like January 1st was maybe three or four years ago at this point. Uh, Casey is one of the brightest minds in real estate, a property economist, and we've asked him to brief us on where things stand in the real estate and the capital markets. Casey, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Bill. Great to great to be with everybody. I hope everybody it's a chance to have a little downtime for the fourth of July. I think we we've earned it, as you said. The speedometer's rolled over half of the year. So we'll yeah. we'll jump right in, right in here. Um, so I thought we'd start with, you know, just putting the COVID-19 numbers in perspective. And I, I think as appraisers, it's something that we're gonna have to keep in mind because it, it can really factor into you know some of our assumptions and in you know you know market conditions adjustments so the numbers are atrocious um the site i go to that is really very neutral very fact-based no politics involved in it is the john hopkins university they do a great map update everything pulled this one last night so we're over 10.4 million cases globally uh right now and the united states leads so you know in the in the competition for us always to be top we're, we're we're there but i want to put these numbers in perspective so um you know june 30th yesterday we had 10.4 million cases that's up from 7 million just a month ago and to put that number in perspective that almost you know 2.4 two and a half million increase we were at just 900,000 less than a million globally on april 1st so we've had a tenfold more than a tenfold increase in three months uh, again, we're 25% of the cases in the world, we're the most in the world. And if you break it down by states, which I love what they do here, we're starting to see some movement. California's moved uh, ahead of New Jersey now into number two. New York is still number one. Uh, Florida's moved up into the top five. You know, uh, Bill, you know, stay there in DC, you know, don't go to Illinois, don't go to any meetings there. <laughs> uh, Arizona yeah. moved into the top 10, North Carolina. And it's important because these cases in these rolling hotspots are probably going to affect things like occupancy orders and stand downs on restaurants in your retail that you might be appraising or impacting hotel. So when we're trying to make decisions about, you know, kind of a market correction factor. Remember those, those old ones from my early career in, in the oil patch days, uh, how, we, how we'd forecast Denver or Houston to come back. We're probably looking at that same technique today. So I think that's why I wanted to start with this is these numbers can kind of help us put that in perspective there. Um, let's see, a little bit of lag here and moving, Bill. Let's see, it's not advancing, but we'll see what we can do here. Try the arrow key. There we go. All right. So the next thing I'm always, you know, you're in academia, you got to give a good, you got to give a good reading recommendation. So I thought I'd start off one because I do, I learned early in my career that I didn't understand enough about economics to really be good at discounted cash flow analysis in my assumptions. So uh, this is a book my kids got me for Father's Day. I'd lost this and they found it and gave it back to me. Whatever happened to Penny Candy? And it's really a simple book on kind of the economics that you need. And uh, my favorite chapter, I won't spoil it, is chapter two. Um, and it's uh, uh, TANSTAFFEL. The acronym it stands for there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. And I, I think that's you know really a lot of what we do within our appraisal analyses is trying to explain what the, what the lunch is really gonna cost, what that real estate's really worth. So I really recommend this. It's a simple read, it's a fun read. You can still get in a, you know, a, a beverage and some fireworks over the weekend and not, and not destroy it. So good reading recommendation. Oh, seems like there wants to be a little bit of a lag here today. Seems to be hooking up a little bit, Bill. Try clicking on the screen and then arrow down. <clears throat> yeah, the arrow, the arrow's not working. You said, what was the other trick? And then once you click on the screen, hit arrow down. Okay. 
there we go. <clears throat> okay, so speaking, <clears throat> so speaking of economics, I thought, you know, good couple of refreshes. Whenever I find something simple, I'd like to share it. So this is one on GDP. We're going to get our first look, the government's first guess on GDP here at the end of July. And so this is a great video that was um, embedded into a Wall Street Journal article. Really encourage folks to look at it. Really explains the composition. Um, remember, our GDP last year <clears throat> was just over $21 trillion. The formula is there down at the bottom. It, and it's uh, the C is consumption. It's about two thirds of our economy. The I is business investment. Then you get government spending, and then you net out imports and exports. And remember, imports take away from our GDP. There's someone else's GDP. So all the forecasts are the GDP for the second quarter is going to drop 30 percent. I'm not in that camp because the Fed's put in almost essentially a half a year of GDP into the economy. Uh, Seven trillion dollars in the balance sheet. It'll probably be over 10 trillion dollars. Um, here by fall so we take it out in one bucket and we put it back in another i think we'll see somewhere between a five and ten percent decline um, but this is a great one if you need a quick refresher on gdp all right jobs we have a big jobs report coming we get adp jobs numbers this morning that's private payroll i watch them a lot more than the made-up government jobs numbers <laughs> i usually call it bls minus l equals bs because they don't know what they're doing on the labor but it's not all their fault this time so i put the april and the may job numbers on on either side of what I called the Humpty Dumpty jobs report from April and jobs had a great fall. Now it's up to all of the CEOs and the Fedsmen to put it back together. <clears throat> but understand, <clears throat> excuse me, what happened in March. We passed the CARES bill and for the first time ever, we allowed 1099 workers, which a lot of appraisers are 1099 workers or sole proprietors um, to be eligible for unemployment insurance. So the April numbers of 20 million 20.5 million job loss was probably exaggerated. You can't compare the April, May numbers to any prior time. We've never had that. And then the May numbers, it looked like, hey, we're all we're all recovered. And we and we really weren't all recovered. So um, if you if you remember in the in the in in the in the May numbers, we um, uh, it said we created two and a half million jobs, and we really didn't because if you're a 1099 or um, sole proprietor that filed for unemployment insurance, one of the tests to keep that is that you have to um, is that you have to uh, be looking for a job. Well, if you're a sole proprietor and you're trying to keep your business going, you're obviously not you're not doing that. So they dropped nine million of them out. If you put those nine million that really are still essentially unemployed, their sole proprietor businesses are do, not doing well. Um, that we really did lose jobs. So keep that in mind. The CARES bill has really distorted the government jobs numbers that we'll get on Friday. And so it's not all their fault. <clears throat> on ADP, we get that this morning. I look at ADP, this is the private payrolls. They, they're, they're the largest private payroll processor in the country. They give us a lot of good detail, my type of employee and company and everything else. And when they said, look, at, we lost another 2.7 million in May. I think we're gonna see a similar number around two and a half to three million this morning. And uh, the other one I put down there at the bottom is I look at Challenger Gray on job cuts. So job cuts don't count in the job in the BLS jobs number because you're likely still receiving an unemployment or a, a benefit from your employer. You've been furloughed. They're giving you 30, 60, 90 days, whatever. Uh, and until those benefits run out, <clears throat> you're not counted as unemployed. So look at those numbers. There's another million and a half that we're, we're running there. So kind of keep these numbers in perspective be a little sus suspect of what you see on, on Friday. Um, here's the Challenger Gray job numbers. You can see 1.4 million loss this year. April and May were the largest totals ever of job cuts. They surpassed even the Great Recession job cuts in the worst months that we had there. So I look at this and they give you stratification. You can get down to the state level and in the industry level. So very helpful if you're appraising a particular property, if you're in hospitality uh, or retail on that side. Why don't I stop there before we go into some of the commercial property and see if I scared you too much there, Bill, or maybe any other questions you've heard from appraisers about the economy? <laughs> I mean, it's it's um it's very shocking out there in the real world, and I mean you see it in storefronts uh, in my neighborhood. I was out having breakfast with my wife yesterday at a roadside diner, and I looked across the street at a, a retail strip center. And about half of the boards, uh, the billboards uh, with name signs, company name signs, had been removed just in the last month. Um, so you have the, the mattress center and the, the uh, dry cleaners and the restaurant that, you know, they've all 
cease their operations. And you can see economic activity declining right before your eyes. I mean, it's quieter. Um, it, you, you notice um, a few, you know, less traffic. You, you notice less activity. I mean, this is real. This is a real time, a real shock to the entire economy, and and to practically everyone uh, in in our country. And it's it's uh, we're, we're we're an unprecedented time, in my view. No, I agree. I love your pointing out the kind of the anecdotal indicators. I encourage, you know, appraisers, you know, to, to to do that, drive around a little bit more. I remember early in my career before we had all of the, you know, Google Maps and internet technology, we would literally go drive our neighborhoods and look at what's going on. And it really is shocking to see what's already closed up and how many restaurants are gone. And so, you know, that's stuff you can put in your neighborhood analysis to go along with this data that, you know, I think, you know, Stephanie Coleman reminds us, really make sure you bulletproof those market conditions adjustments. And so I love you pointing that out. Yeah. And I think I read an article you posted on LinkedIn about the restaurant industry and the, the restaurant chains that were at risk of closure moving ahead. And I looked at that article and in my area, which is Northern Virginia, the Woodbridge, Virginia area, I, I think the entire area of Prince William County would, would, would basically shut down because of the, the types of restaurants that they have. I mean, it, it was a, a, a cavalcade of, of restaurants that had operate in this area that would, would go dark and it would literally create a dark situation throughout the county that I live in. I, I don't know that there's any restaurant that would remain open or wasn't on that list. I mean, it was, it's, it's a very dire situation, unfortunately. Yeah, it is, you know, good resource there is like the National Restaurant Association, the, the safe NRA that you can actually eat. <laughs> um, right. But, you know, their, their numbers show the range estimates are here anywhere between 40 and as much as 80% of all restaurants could could close by this fall. I mean, so those are those are really concerning numbers. So, well, that's a good pivot maybe into the next uh, next slide here on um, you know what's happening with CRE transaction activity. So uh, th this was uh, the front part is a little post that I had as well. Um, Real Capital Analytics, I've, I've followed their data and used it for many years. Uh, they do a great job and granularity down to the. MSA level by property type. And, uh, you know, I've got CoStars there um, just as their headline. I, I don't subscribe to CoStars, so I can't see the full story, but they're confirming that May again was a big drop in CRE transaction activity. And so it's going to be harder to find these comparables and the comparables and things that are selling are selling for very different reasons. They're, they're probably more your high quality. If you see retail that's selling, it's probably a dominant grocery anchor deal where the credit is still strong. So it's going to take more adjustment type work here, but this is, this is very real. It's going to be harder for us to do our assignments. So, you know, when you're considering your time estimates and your fee estimates, you've probably got more primary research to do here, but you can see industrial and apartment are still, that have the, you know, are doing better, have the least decline, but hotel and retail, it's awful. In fact, the April numbers that RCA posted for May showed that, um, that it was the worst month for hotel sales ever. They only had 10 transactions nationwide in April. The prior record was 21 in April of 2009. So um, I, I feel for our colleagues, we're gonna have to really be creative. REITs are still doing deals. The other thing affecting this transaction activity is something that just concluded yesterday. All of the um, pension uh, funds, institutional money, the PREA, they uh, had to deal with their mark-to-market -market adjustments at the end of second quarter. They didn't do them first quarter because we just didn't have enough data to know what to adjust. So right. most okay. of them went to the sidelines over the last 30 to 60 days to figure those out and figure out how to reallocate capital. So that was a big distortion that I think that money comes back. It reallocates maybe less hotel and retail and a lot more multifamily and industrial. And I think the reason it comes back is because they need yield. They can't find the yield in the bond. They can't find it in a stock where half the dividends have been suspended. So I think this money will come back, but it's going to be much more selective on that side. Um, I did a thing, I'm a big follower of corporate earnings. I think for appraisers, one of the best bulletproof things you can have in your appraisal 
um, is um, look at corporate earnings, whether it's a tenant in your center or your office building or an industrial building. The companies do confession to the SEC each quarter. We're getting ready in another few weeks to start second quarter. And even though they don't give forward guidance anymore, I hope they never go back to giving us forward financial guidance because just look at their behavior. When they tell you what they're doing on CapEx or they tell you what their rent collections were, these are phenomenal supporting nuggets of information to help you as an appraiser. So I did a webinar, a nationwide one, with Eddie Blanton, the CCM CEO. Here's the YouTube and the slides, so I won't go into that, um, but just great nuggets. One of my favorite ones was Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers has said, uh, you know, they're good for experiential retail, and they said before COVID, they were 75% face-to-face consultations. Within 60 days, they went to 75% um, virtual, and their CEO said, you know what? maybe we don't need re real estate as much maybe we don't need to be in a center so think about extrapolating that to a gym or something else that you're appraising these are those nuggets that can really that can really help you so um, maybe this will help you from quarter one uh, so when you bundle it all together and say all right casey there's too many things here to look at tell me just four things that you're looking at that are helping guide you so i, I love the transportation metrics i've all, always followed the railroad but uh the rail time and rail traffic but at the top there um, TSA passenger count. So this is a relatively new metric. Most of us didn't realize until this COVID environment that the TSA tracks how many passengers go through our airports every day. And going into March, it was over 2.3 million a day. Last summer, it was over 2.6 million a day. That collapsed to 85,000 in April. Just phenomenal. Well, we need to see that recover. And as that recovers, that'll really be the best barometer as to the trajectory of recovery here. So good news, last week we got up to 600,000 passengers a day. That's a long ways from 2.3, 2.4 million. But I think it's one of the best metrics if overall you're trying to talk about what's happening. And they break that data down by airport so it can really help you at an MSA level. The other one uh, is uh, LTSS, Loans Transferred to Special Servicers. So TREP does a great job with this in CMBS. You can sign up for their free um, weekly report that gives this update information. And this is what happens to a loan, kind of like in, a, in the bank equipment would be getting transferred to, you know, um, you know, the workout, before it goes to workout, part problem credit, put it on non-accrual. So this tells you what's coming and the volume is phenomenal. And the chart down there at the bottom shows you what's happening to lodging. We've gone from say 2% loans transfer to special servicing to over 16%. You can see it's not bad in industrial or multifamily. So that I think factors in when you're picking a cap rate or you're trying to justify things. These are credit metrics that tell you things are, are holding up. Um, the third one I just mentioned was CRE transaction activity. I really watch what's happening there. That tells us if people aren't buying and trading. That tells us there's less demand. And then I mentioned corporate earnings. So those are the four big ones, and they help me um, have all my crazy ideas <laughs> on that side. Uh, that any, you, you, you talk with everybody, any things you would add to that? But those are my four simple ones. <laughs> Oh, uh, you know, I, I think those are great. I, I'm going to send you a COVID health uh, portal that we just got access to yesterday. I'm kind of curious if, if there's anything for appraisers to review there. It, it's, uh, it's a giant database of, of health related information. I was I was likening it to the TSA passenger count potentially as another source of information, trying to whittle that down and extract it into a, a bite size um piece of information for a property analyst I, i'm not sure that we can do that just yet but I, I would be interested in your opinions on that so look for that uh, later today you know i, I think all of the, all of this information is great and I, I think we've definitely expected this on the special servicer side uh that, that this was a wave that was that was going to hit because of the structures and where those investments are laid um, that that is uh, people, people have been telling me for three months now that that um, a lot of financial institutions have been telling their staff to take their time off now uh, in the late spring uh, in expectation for a very busy quarter three and quarter four. And I think that's true, at least on the default and special servicing side, that's going to be a very active and very busy, unfortunately, a very busy um, uh, sector. Uh, for for the valuation profession moving forward, and I guess you know the big question is when does when does activity sort of start to to pick up uh, on the on the new origination side? Every all the lenders were so focused on PPP lending, 
they were diverting resources away from commercial real estate lending and elsewhere, business lending, to focus on PPP, and that's at, at the pendulum swinging back, but you know, where's the demand for it right now when you, you have all this economic shock still, still filtering through? Yeah, no, great, great question. I think it gets real bad this fall. And, um, you know, we'll get to it in a minute, you know, when you have the FHFA saying, let's extend, you know, the um, rent forbearance, um, that puts more strain on these deals. And we forget sometimes how all this works and what that does to mortgage servicers that have to advance the funds. And, and then, you know, do you really think if you have people not pay their rent for six or 12 months and then say, let's chew it up out a while, even if you put it on a one year payment plan, you're looking at 10 to 25 percent monthly rent increases. And remember, right now, we're at one in five of all renters are in a forbearance program right now. That's just staggering, over 20, only over 20 million rental uh, units out there. So I don't think everybody's going to be able to pay it. These are some of your more fragile uh, income demographics. And um, I don't think we've connected all those dots yet. So um, I, agree. These, I think the corporate earnings, you know, look at Freddie Mac's um, and, and Fannie's earnings and look what happened in first quarter. You know, they're owned by the government, but <laughs> or their conservatorship. But um, those numbers were ugly um, from the Freddie Mac standpoint. All right. So here's the one that's important because a lot of appraisers are figuring out who's who's got these bad loans and what's going to happen, like you said, Bill. And I think unlike 2009, we're going to see this um, problem, these problems play out differently. I don't think we're going to go through and see a wave necessarily of foreclosures on commercial properties. We're going to see selling the bad debt. So there are already VINs in there that are mining and talking to banks and everybody else about scoop up all of your um of your hotel deals and we'll buy them at you know 70 60 50 whatever cents on the dollar and so we may see whole debt portfolios um transfer rather than going to the individual assets and that could affect you know demand and work on the valuation so this is an, another one that real capital Inks has done a good job to help us out they looked at all the different lending sources and what they have by property type so look at that big government agency orange line there. Ninety-three mm -hmm. percent of all multifamily loans are are in Freddie and Fannie, the GSE. So it's no wonder they the Fed moved right away, the government-controlled entity, to intervene and start you know rent forbearance and loan forbearance programs. That's the one entity. And remember last time we talked, Bill, when I was at the Fed, when we had to put the GSEs in conservatorship and what a shock that was. Well, we won't have that shock this time. They're already there. <laughs> mm -hmm. already got the, they, they can call the treasury and ask them for money. But here's the other good news. At the top, look at hotel and multifamily. Look at the different property types, the, the circle there, or the light orange. No one entity has all the hotel loans this time. So there's some capacity or bandwidth to work through it, whether you're you know, a national bank, a regional bank, an insurance company. And the same kind of goes on with retail, the light blue there. So that's something very different because as you remember, Bill, last time it was, you know, 60, 70 percent of all of the commercial real estate by all property types was in the banks. And that's what locked us up. So I think this is a very encouraging. So when I look for optimistic signs, I got to dig deep. But here's here's one that's good and it might help appraisers understand who's got the debt if they have a property type specialty. This is one of my favorite ones that I would encourage appraisers to think about a graphic like this for each of their property types. The National Apartment Association put this together and it says, where does a dollar of rent go? So that's what we're doing in our NOI analysis and our DCS. And we're trying to figure out the last bit of the dollar goes to who? <laughs> the property owner, right? And so look at what's happening. If we're in loan forbearance programs, your LTV is going up. You're going to have more of the dollar that has to go to debt service. If we have COVID realities, we're going to have more cleaning, more tenant turnover costs because nobody wants old carpet in an apartment that might have COVID lurking in it. A whole lot more of that dollar is going to things other than back to the owner and, and the NOI. And so I think if you apply this to retail, look at occupancy restrictions on restaurants or hotels, and you can only operate at 50%, but you still have the same cost, that dollar shrinks. And that's gonna really affect kind of, you know, that discussion we've had before, what happens to cap rate and NOI determines what happens to value. And so last time in 2009, we saw cap rates go from 2008 to mid 2009, we saw them shear up quite a bit. Uh, 200 basis points in about six quarters, and that wiped out 25% of the value. 
And then we saw the next three years, the NOI drop from vacancy rising, rents going down. I don't think we're gonna see the cap rate shock this time. The Fed's put too much liquidity. Anything that won't sell, the Fed will come in and set a low price for it. And that's what they're basically telling us they're doing. So the Fed is the market in, in, uh, in, in versus really the market being the market. So I think we need to think about that. And I think the NOI is gonna be the big impact and less so on the cap rate. But I really love this graphic and thinking about all the forbearance um, wrinkles that go through this. Here's the other one. We will, we'll pause and talk about this one, Bill, because I'm sure you're getting questions from, from our members. The FHFA announced this week that they're going to extend the eviction and, and uh, foreclosure moratoriums and the rent forbearance to six months from three months. So three month period was set to end here in July. Now they can extend that six months. I have a feeling with the elections, this is going to go on beyond that. And what we have to think about, this is a trick question for appraisers. So when you're appraising a multifamily property and you've got 20 percent of your tenants that are in rent forbearance, um, but then you say, well, that's offset by the borrowers got loan forbearance, right? No, remember market value, especially if you're doing for a financial institution, it's a cash basis. You can't consider the financing. So you need to know the percentage that are in rent forbearance because that really affects your credit loss. You got vacancy and credit loss. And so you might have it at 20% initially because you don't know what's going to happen or how that's going to play out. But then you may have a market correction and that moderate one or two years later, but um, don't get trapped in this one about how to deal with the rent forbearance and that it's mitigated by loan forbearance. You're doing a market value cash equivalent basis thing. But I don't know if you've had any thoughts or questions on this one, but this one scared the bejesus out of me for appraisers when I saw well, this one. Sounds like the, the work of appraisers has just become more difficult through this process. So uh, there's it's much more complicated and involved and you got to dig deeper and lean into this more than you than you might have a year ago. Yeah, and think these numbers, these rent forbearance numbers can be different from at the property level from the submarket or the overall market. And so you might find it in the suburban markets, it's not nearly as bad as an urban market because the suburban is working at home in Zoom and they're paying their rent. And actually some companies are giving subsidies now uh, to, to young tech professionals to, to pay their rent so they don't have to go into forbearance on that side. So um, remember, you may have a property level that's real high, but again, your job is market and look at what the market is and understand why your property might be an anomaly. It may be close to a, a factory, an auto factory that was idled for a while and that's that's why it's maybe higher. But um, this one's gonna be interesting to see how it plays out. I think it's gonna give us, um, it's gonna be a new bottle of Tums and um, aspirin on our desk to just deal with the multifamily. It's gonna, it's gonna get challenging. So um, the uh, next, next one here is hotel. I wanna spend a little bit of time on because it's probably, I, I basically will not do a hotel appraisal or litigation right now because I, I don't know what I don't know. It's that that difficult. But um, I wrote this piece uh, back at the, a month ago on the other L&T industry. So we think L&T is logistics and transportation, but think of leisure and travel. And it's not just hotels. It's things like all those theme parks, Disney, Universal, Six Flags, music venues, concert venues. Think of your, your, your um, public um, venues, uh, entertainment venues that are owned by the city or the state or the local government that are on a bond issue and they don't have anything going on there. So um, here's, I, I pointed out the metrics there. This is the quote from Real Capitalytics about only 10 transactions and Jim Costello's note there, he's never seen a level of illiquidity like this. And that's where it really gets hard for us as appraisers when we have people that are following this stuff saying there's no liquidity. What's market value when there's no transparency, no price um, on that side? So the next one though, is one that we're gonna have to think about as we come out of this and how we think about functional and economic obsolescence in hotel properties. So um, I had an opportunity to speak with a number of the hotel CEOs during earnings season and be on their on the earnings calls. And they said, look at we're going smaller, less dense properties um, going forward. We just don't think we're going back to these big dense hotel properties. We're gonna go back to the future and do more exterior entry. So one of the property hotel property types that is just crushing it right now are extended stay. They're rear entry, they have kitchens, they're you know, they're near where you can go get groceries and um, you know and cook in the unit. Um, contactless everything, the capex spend that's gonna be required in hotels. We'll wake up a year from now and we will not see a check-in desk. We will not have valet parking at a hotel. Everything will be done on a phone app. So think of the technology, think of all that 
being done. When you get to your hotel room, I've recently done this, the hotel room had a sealed wrapper at the entrance. I had to break the wrapper, then use my phone app to go in. When I got in, the beds weren't made and the linens weren't out in the bathroom. There was a package that was sealed with all of the bed linens and everything so that I knew nobody had touched them. So guess what? I didn't have to make the bed. I mean, I had to make the bed and not, not have it done for me. So these are things. And then the bottom line one there, I really want appraisers to think about. Um, how does a hotel, what's the economic feasibility when you have occupancy restrictions that say you can't be more than 50%? And believe it or not, cities and local governments are putting in permanent occupancy restrictions on hotels. They're doing it on restaurants as well. And what those appraisers that do eminent domain work will resonate, this will resonate with them. In my opinion, when a local government says now you can only operate at 25% or 50% or whatever, that's an eminent domain action. They've done a taking without compensation. And major hotel companies are looking at class action suits now picking on major cities where they're gonna involve appraisers to help them document the, the taking in value. And this could be a real opportunity for business. I think a real neat appraisal uh, journal article for some of our great people out there to, that do hotels to, to look at. But um, this concerns me. What's the economic feasibility of a hotel with occupancy restrictions? Marriott recently shared an example in, in suburban Atlanta. One of our one of their best opened new concepts um, was uh, up in the Avalon area, planned unit community north of um, the perimeter highway in Atlanta. It opened about two and a half years ago. It was one of their best performing hotels on every metric. They just mothballed it. They said it's too expensive to operate it at just 25% or 50%. And they and they went through a detail of laying off 100 employees at that one hotel. And only 20% were what I would consider, you know, lower wage, you know, your, your uh, maid service, housekeeping, uh, front desk. 80% or 80 of those 100 were people making over $75,000 a year up to 125,000. They were banquet managers, sales and marketing, all those other people. So when we think about the impact on these hotels and the cost to get them up and going, you know, it's that 80-20 principle. It costs 80% of the fixed cost, even if you uh, just open it up for 20%. So is it economically feasible? So I'm really worried okay, about that. Let me ask you real quick on that. So those 10 yeah. deals that were actually executed, what did those look like? I mean, were those in the pipeline already? And then they did some additional due diligence and and felt comfortable around their the legacy approach that they had, or are they taking an entirely new approach and looking at it in, di in a different way and then getting comfortable and moving forward? Do you have any sense of what the, the 10 that actually did occur, what, what that profile looks like? Yeah, so I'd say on those that are under construction, it's kind of a Sergeant, Sar Sergeant Schultz from Hogan's Heroes approach that I just ate myself. <laughs> yeah. um, I see no evil, I hear no evil, I'm not counting any evil. It's a construction loan, nobody wants to have an impaired loan. Let's just get the doggone thing built. And then when it's done and we have to convert it, um, we'll look at the value at that point. So I think everything that's under construction is gonna get done. The banks don't wanna really know. The regulators don't want the banks to really know. And we'll get to that in a minute in these financial institution letters that are going out. Um, but I think that's when the rubber hits the road, really the end of this year, next year, is these completed assets that don't have occupancy. We have these occupancy orders in place. You know, think about it. The CDC said this week, the coronavirus is out of control in the United States. Essentially, they surrendered and said, I don't think occupancy restrictions shelter in place. We can put that genie back in the bottle. So they're basically hinting that they're going to go to a herd um, immunity model, which says, let's isolate the 20% vulnerable population, the old, the diabetics like me, and the other 80% of you go get it, get immune, and then we can get the economy going again. That's essentially what we've done for hundreds of years in dealing with these types of health crises, whether it was polio or you know, or SARS or anything else. So that's a pretty scary prospect that this could go on for an extended period of time. And these businesses can't go on six, 12, 18, 24 months at half occupancy. And so even if you do a market correction factor, I went back, was reading some of my old appraisals in Denver and Houston from the oil patch days. And, you know, we would guess it would be two years for Denver to recover. And then two years later, we'd say, well, that was wrong. We've got to do it another two years. By the time we got done, it was eight years. <laughs> so, right. um, it's it's hard. I would I would I would almost suggest to appraisers right now do do more of a, a consultation or a consulting assignment than evaluation assignment on a hotel. We just don't know what we don't know yet. It's really really difficult. So um, here's the other one um, that's really concerns me. The market today, the I call it the big market distortion. This is the Fed, and um, 
so uh, you know, look at where the stock market is. So yesterday we concluded with the best quarter in, in decades or years in both the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. And you look at everything I just laid out and you have to ask yourself, you know, what's going on? Where's the disconnect? In fact, I did a LinkedIn post on that yesterday saying, somebody please explain it to me. Um, I, I just can't connect the dots here on this. Um, and then this is where I want people to focus on the Fed. So we're supposed to be estimating market value and it'd be a market, you have to have more than one participant. And right now the Fed is the dominant participant. Their balance sheet ballooned to 4.3 to 4.5 trillion after the great recession. And they whittled that back down below 4 trillion at the beginning of this year. And they ballooned it within 60 days to over 7 trillion. It's going to 10, to put 10 trillion in perspective, Remember that GDP number I gave you? That's almost half a year of GDP. And if they go to 20 trillion, that's an entire year of GDP. And so I put the numbers in the links here so you can kind of keep track of how quickly in the in the volume of security. So the Fed's purchasing things it's never done before. It didn't do this in 2009. They're really intervening in the market. And I don't think we have true price discovery. And the reason I mentioned this is I would encourage appraisers to consider adding an extraordinary assumption about the market today and what an impact the Fed is and that you have to, you can't take out um, the Fed from the market to get price discovery, that they're, they're preventing that price discovery because if something's not selling, the Fed steps in and sets the price. You think I'm crazy? Look at this as the list um, covered a lot, CNBC, Market Beat this week on what all the Fed is doing. They've put down 750 public companies that they're intervening and buying their corporate bonds. You really think that Apple and Walmart and Home Depot really need the Fed in there buying their bonds? Has anybody looked at their earnings and their revenue and their performance and what's happened to their stock price? This really concerns me that the Fed, without governors on them, is, is in, engaging in the market to this level. And this trickles down to us in real estate. What next? REITs, REITs that they don't see that are selling proper, properly and they intervene and buy them. We're really the kind of help we need is the Fed intervening at the municipal level. Uh, in the CARES bill, only cities with the 500,000 or more in population got financial support. So that's 10%, that was 36 markets. 10% of our MSA has got any support. The other 90%, none. Think of the 138 college towns that play NCAA Division I athletics, no help, kids gone, no commencement season, no summer camps, and maybe not a, a football season like we, we knew it with all divisions participating. They are just decimated in terms of these towns and small businesses. So if you're appraising in a small town, you really need to understand how dire it is. This is where the Fed should be supporting really the, you know, the utility bonds, the sewer plant, the airport, um, those type things instead of buying Apple and Walmart. Um, the other one is look at Warren Buffett. So believe it or not, the Fed has put Berkshire Hathaway now on their balance sheet. Who would have thought, Bill? <laughs> going, going back to 2009 and 10, that we would, uh, I guess maybe they're needing to balance out the ETFs that they're buying and maybe the losses they're going to incur there to, uh, to better credits. But th this really concerns me. The Fed is, is a huge player in the market. And so I'll stop here where we can talk a little bit more. These fill letters, financial institution letters. And before the bank stress test, the Fed was, was leaking these out in little dribs and drabs. And um, it's important that we kind of keep an eye on these because they they basically say, they imply like they're saying something, but they really aren't telling us anything that's material. So I put a couple of them down here and had some comment. So uh, in one of these recent ones from a week or two ago, last month, um, you know, they commented on real estate values and they said, you know, uh, we want you to make sure that estimates of collateral values, um, examiners should ascertain whether the values are based on assumptions that are prudent and realistic. Give me a break. <laughs> what is prudent and realistic right now? I mean, this is what Stephanie's been telling us, you know, you really got to support those market conditions adjustments. And then when you do, you're probably not going to have a bank client when you look back at the numbers I just gave you and you try to support what's prudent and realistic. So the, the these letters, what the Fed was basically telling the banks was, you know, we're glad you did PPP loans and we, we're not going to criticize you for that. But when it comes to calculating your allowance and your capital, uh, they're going to factor in. <laughs> and so remember when the banks did these loans, they've got to service them. They've got to deal with, you know, rating those type of loans and assets. And um, are, it's going to be a lot of heartburn. And so that what ultimately these led up to was the bank stress test last week. And essentially what the Federal Reserve did, and I've been... Um, 
uh, I, I, they growled at me for saying this, but the Fed essentially nationalized the banks last week. What they said, just imagine this, you're a company and think about the Fed buying and the Fed comes into the banks and says, I don't care that your credit metrics are okay. I don't care that you're well capitalized, that your tier one capital ratio is fine, that you've met all the hurdles that we've asked you to over the last 10 years. We're afraid of the future and we're not gonna let you pay a dividend anymore. You're, you're done and you can't do stock repurchases. Who's gonna invest in a bank stock with that scenario today? They just precluded the banks from raising capital again. So if the banks do need to go to the market and say, well, maybe our tier one capital ratio dropped from 10 to eight, um, but we think we still have a plan. We don't have a lot of hotel loans. We're, we're good in multifamily. We can get through the rent forbearance and loan forbearance issues. Um, uh, so distinguish us and we'd like to raise some capital. Look at if Hertz can have market interest in bankruptcy and a new IPO, I guarantee you the banks could raise money. But we have essentially nationalized the banks. And, and here's why those stress tests are so important. Here's what I'm hearing from developer and, um, and, and bank lending CRE clients. They basically said over the last few days, they've been called from their bank where they had deals that were in process, deals that were new business. And the bank has said, we're just having to pull the plug. Things have changed. Um, we can't pay a dividend. We don't know what the Fed's going to impose on us. So we're killing new business opportunities. So that has a ripple effect. So I'd stay very close in touch if you have current appraisal assignments for banks and it's a new business opportunity, a refinancing. Um, you really need to stay in touch because the message the Fed has given to the banks is, you know, kind of like the Seinfeld episode, no soup for you no dividends for you. <laughs> that makes it very difficult. Why would they do new business? They're hoarding all of their capital, hoping they can get through the credit metrics. So I don't know, you know, you watch these real closely, but these fill letters are kind of canaries in the coal mine. They were the canary before the bank stress test. And I really worry the Fed's intervening in the market to buy company bonds and all this other stuff, and they need capital flowing, yet they just locked it up in the banks from a new business standpoint, from my perspective. Hmm. So this is a situation where they're they're getting in the way potentially from from um, economic growth or recovery. Yeah, and you know, Bill, because you guys in the institute was at the front line of this when when I was the Fed, two thousand five to ten. It really trying to distinguish when Dodd Frank was coming about between the community banks and the you know what they call the SIFI banks or the really large banks. You know, the community banks didn't blow up real estate last time. You know, in life insurance companies didn't blow up um, the world and commercial real estate. It was a few bad actors in the distortion of subprime. And it was a, a bloody battle. And if it weren't for industry and people like the appraisal institute engaging, we probably would have had a, a worse situation and outcome for our community banks. It wasn't wasn't great, but um, anyway, so I, I bring this to the attention because this is gonna affect appraisal business, I think, going forward. And I think it's gonna affect banks' interest in doing new new business and refinance and new development because they've basically just been told by the regulators, hey, it's it's okay to do it, but we're still coming at you with all of the enforcement penalties on capital and allowance, and uh, and we're not gonna let you pay dividends. We're just afraid of the future. Really, really well, concerned. If, if the, the depository institutions are taking, or they're moving to the sidelines for capital, you got to go somewhere else. I mean, what are we seeing from other sources, from insurance or CMBS? Uh, are so, there some yeah, signs there question. to make up for it? Yeah, it's a great question. So CMBS is locked up. We don't know how to hedge or price. So CMBS has been shut down for two months. It's what happened in 2009. And I, I was there and, you know, went hat in hand to the to the TREP folks at the New York Fed and said, how, how do we restart this sucker? And you remember I talked to you about, you know, it was the Flagler deal down in Florida, that was the first one we had to figure out and get a lot of good uh, good help from the appraisal institute with TREP on that. So CMBS is locked up. The, the two players I see, the banks were there and they were doing a pretty good job, particularly the community banks. They've now been hit by this stuff uh, coming out from the, from the Fed and the regulators. Um, and remember, we don't have new interagency appraisal guidelines. The last ones were 2010. Dodd-Frank passed since then and was implemented. And think of all the things that we have had happen than the regulators for another decade. It was a decade in 2010 since they did it last time. And, and I, I tell them this in my you know regular FFIC briefings, you're not, your job number one is to go back and revisit interagency appraisal guidelines. We need some real clear 
lines here. They're not they're not doing their job on this front. So another source that's out there, I would encourage appraisers to get acquainted with are credit unions. So believe it or not, we have more credit unions than we do banks. And um, we have some big ones and they have syndications where they can do these deals. Um, I've taken three deals that got kicked out of banks recently and we're able to take them to credit unions like a, a Delta credit union or a Navy credit union that do over a billion a year. And they were able to do those pretty quickly and smoothly with the appraisal process all in a 30 to 45 day period of time. So they're one of the entities, particularly if you have an under $10 million loan or property, they're doing a lot of that stuff. They're really supporting the community, their members. So uh, I think credit unions are a great source of business and opportunity um, for the appraisers. The life companies are still there. They've got to, they had to get through this mark to market for Q2. And I think you're going to see them because they've, they've already raised this capital for an insurance product, a retirement plan, an annuity. So they know they've got to be getting, you know, three, four or 5% return. And they have the time to be patient for the value to come back. They need the yield. So I think the insurance companies will definitely be back here in August and September with reallocated numbers. Um, but I think if you're a hotel deal, it's tough. But I will tell you, the other one is there's a ton of equity capital. You're going to see a lot of private equity. I'll give you an example. Starwood this morning was announced. Starwood went over and they just bought a huge portfolio in the UK on great hotel assets um, throughout Europe that are just being given away almost. And so they stepped in with a big equity fund. So the equity sources of capital, um, the REITs are there. I'm on a board of directors for a public REIT. It's an industrial one, Monmouth, out of the New York region. Our primary focus is logistics and industrial. Our biggest tenant is FedEx. We're buying deals. We have a full pipeline. We're closing them and we're doing them in a, you know, r roughly a six cap rate range. Um, no issues at closing. Um, so there are things that are that are happening in trading and clients. I'd say, you know, non hotel and retail REITs are out there. Uh, I think a lot of retail REITs are going to look at liquidations. Um, so there's got to be some work done there. Uh, the pension and life company institutional money will be back this fall in August. Uh, credit unions, I think, are going to step in and, and fill the gap that has been um, the rug that's been pulled out from underneath the banks right now. So those are three mm -hmm. I can throw out there. Yeah, I think that the concern that I would have with updating guidance during a crisis is that 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 could be used in any number of ways to hide issues, material issues, or cover things up in some way. Um, if you really want to have that apples to apples comparison, you've got to be, you know, be consistent on that front. So I would worry a little bit about how things might be tweaked or modified in some way to potentially try to uh, obfuscate or cover up, uh, you know, some real some real issues that we're facing today on the valuation side. I, that that would be my only real concern about doing it right now in the midst of a crisis. No, you're you're prudent to throw that out there, and you've lived through it more than one rodeo, a few of these rodeos, right? And um, the other yeah. thing to keep in mind is in all of these guidance things, when they update these things and all the things that are coming out right now, they're doing everything they can to cut the appraisal piece out of the process. And that, what that tells me is they really don't want that that discovery, or they know the impact might be greater on, on capital or the asset values. And that concerns me is that, and I, and we, I appreciate the Appraisal Institute being so guarded on that, is that you, you know all these things that we're doing and even look at Cecil Accounting, you know, they, the number one resource that we probably, um, that we should have done is, um, I'm gonna move here a minute, my battery just announced it's gonna go low on me. So gonna, we don't wanna lose you now. Yeah, no. so the, um, you know, on, on the guidance issues, they cut the appraisers out of the process, and that concerns me. So using that Cecil example, um, you know, the whole purpose is, you know, in current, uh, current expected credit loss, look across the life of the loan and look at where the, um, uh, you know, where what's going to cause the loss year by year. Well, one of the most important impactful things is the rent roll in the cash flow. Where do you find it? <laughs> you find it in the appraisal. And they should have, that's a perfect example where we should have, they should have turned to the appraisal industry and said, you know, as part of your appraisal, we would like you to have a Cecil type analysis and tell us over your cash flow period on an income producing property, where are the big risks, where are the big tenant turnovers. So those are the years we need to build up a little more capital or allowance for that loan totally ignored it. So I really appreciate the vigilance that the Institute's doing there. And you're, you're right to be guarded because everything they've done really since Dodd-Frank has been to try to eliminate the appraisal 
um, peace and that transparency from the process. So keep fighting the battle. Well, the irony of it all is don't you need to have that price discovery to ultimately rebound and recover from an economic standpoint? I mean, you have to have that, that type of information in order to move forward and understand where you are so you can figure out where to go. Yep, you look at the difference, you know, we try to tout, look at how well our banks recovered because we dealt with the problems, we had price discovery, we got capital in there, we dealt with all that compared to, you know, we like to portray the European or Asian banks, Chinese banks didn't do it, they didn't have that discovery, they didn't have that real cap recapitalization. So here the, the thing we tout that we did right, now we don't want to do in commercial real estate because we're afraid maybe of the of the answer but you're exactly right you can fight it it's like pushing on a string but eventually the market's going to tell you until you get discovery that capital that you need is not going to come back in mm -hmm. agreed so those are my cheery thoughts um <laughs> well okay so why don't we full conclude on this thought casey what 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 really needs to happen for us to turn a corner and, and what do we need to be looking for What, uh, as far as, as signs of improvement and steps forward? What do we need to be keeping our eyes out for uh, on the positive? Yeah, so I, you know, I said, you know, if you want to know if we're really making progress, you can look at the John Hopkins COVID count, and it's saying we're not. But you can look at that TSA passenger count. Look at the transportation metrics, the rail traffic, the rail time indicators by the American Association of Railroad. If things are moving again at the ports and rail and trucking and, and business travels, travelers come back to flying. Those are the best ground level metrics that tell you that demand is coming back, that the economy is coming back, and that'll filter over into the real estate. Um, I pay real close attention to the loan forbearance and, mar and mortgage delinquency data. So again, this week, we got pending home sales, you know, record period and increase in pending home sales and home prices are still going up. We have to understand what's going on. Most of those buyers, there's two, two cohorts. The public home builders told us cohort number one is young professionals leaving dense city environments while they have a job and cash and they know they can work remote with Zoom and whatnot today and they're buying an entry level home, period. They're done with the city. I have two millennial daughters. They were the biggest advocates of experiential re, you know, retail and living in the city and the high life and they're done. I mean, these are 19 to 25 year old kids that are complete 180 degree, they're scarred, much like somebody that was in New York on the day of the World Trade Center uh, attack, that's, that's scarred and is their memory forever. Every time they see a plane or hear a plane going over to you, I still do it, you know, <laughs> at the New York Fed. <laughs> I look up and, and, and think, where is that plane and what's it doing over here? Um, so the transportation metrics is one. Looking at the mortgage and um, loan forbearance data, this is scary stuff. On, on loan forbearance, we didn't go, we didn't do mortgage forbearance last time in the housing crisis. We went straight to foreclosures, clogging it up in the banks and all that nonsense. So the high watermark for, for mortgages in forbearance has been one. We entered this year with less than a quarter percent. We're at over 8% now. 8% of all homeowners are in a mortgage forbearance. Another 6% are delinquent. So we're up to almost 15% of all homeowners that are delinquent in their mortgage or in forbearance. That's double the, the, the peak in the housing crisis in 2009 and 10. So all of those programs and those interventions and rent forbearance and mortgage forbearance and all that, they don't play out for six to 12 months. We're not gonna know the real impact on housing until then. So I'm watching those metrics and they just keep getting worse. And if the unemployment rate stays, the real unemployment rate is over 21%. It's the U6 rate, not the phony U3 rate that you'll hear on Friday, um, but it's over 21%. I think of that one in five Americans are out of a job. Um, you know, 15% of all mortgages in delinquency or in forbearance. Those are pretty scary metrics, and we won't understand the the full impact on the economy and commercial real estate until we pull that intervention out. And that's, I think, what you know FHFA discovered is if they pulled the rug out underneath rent forbearance right now, oh my gosh, things would get really bad. So we got to put the underpinning back in there, and that's distorting the market. So I'm looking at, at those when we can safely begin to extract intervention and not fall back down that'll be very important so looking at those metrics and then i look at the cre transaction activity it's going to be a lot a lot more reduced and what's transacting and what i see transacting are three things anything that's industrial or logistics <laughs> oh, they're using supply stock demand stock e-commerce you name it um, number two 
is um, uh, is multifamily. So it's multifamily in the suburbs. People still like it. They're buying value add. Um, we're seeing just huge portfolios exchange. We're seeing prices go up. You've got to be able to understand what's going on there in the employment in that market. The third thing is some retail is occurring, but it's retail for two purposes. It's grocery anchored or it's stuff that can be repurposed for um, uh, last mile or supply stock where we're going to put the extra inventory. So I'm seeing things like Dave and Buster's or furniture showrooms that are outside a mall with good interstate traffic. Those things are trading, um, but they're trading at like 25 to 50% of cost new, uh, 25 to 50 bucks a square foot, and they're being repurposed. So adaptive reuse is going to be probably one of the big new property types and skill sets that I think we're all going to have to learn. What are those metrics? What's the cap rate? All of that type stuff for those. So um, those are a few of the metrics. And I think just watching the, the, the virus, but the Fed intervention just scares me. If you just don't want to sleep at night, go look at the Fed site and their intervention and you won't sleep. Um, <laughs> you yeah. Know, sell your whole, birthday yeah. stock. <laughs> right. That whole area of adaptive reuse too, I would think would be a very ripe opportunity for consulting work for real estate appraisers. It's tremendous because it starts with, you know, really you got to get highest and best use right again. So, uh, uh, and just because a concept failed in a building doesn't mean, and it sells, it doesn't mean that's a distressed sale. It just means now you're figuring out uh, it's adaptive use. And then, you know, it's it's harder. Government resists. The costs are a little bit more. It takes more equity than it does debt. It's harder to get a permanent loan. Um, so it's a longer drawn out process. And the people that are putting that equity at risk, real money on the line, they really want good fundamental analysis done. So they'll pay for it. So it's good paying, um, thoughtful um, work. And it's challenging like appraisers like they like a good puzzle. It's not some cookie cutter thing. It's a real puzzle. Absolutely. Well, um, Casey, I really appreciate you taking time this morning. Your insights are always eye opening and <laughs> appreciate all the work that you're doing to, to help uh, the industry and profession move forward. Um, keep doing what you're doing. And I hope you, you are well and stay safe ahead uh, any any parting thoughts so i would i would just close on this i really want to thank the appraisal institute for your leadership you know i'm always one that's wondering am i getting what i'm paying for in my dues or whatnot and i will tell you that this is one particular year i feel i got more than what i paid in my dues to be a member every issue you guys have been out in front of whether it was an appraiser as an essential services was it whether it was getting 1031 exchange time periods extended um, you guys have been front and center there you have cross collaborated with other industry professionals whether it's you know nar or ccim or whatnot um, i've honestly never never seen that in my 35 year career so i tip my hat you guys have been on the job nonstop, and um, i think for appraisers that have been busy doing their work and not paying attention um, a lot's been gone going on behind the scenes so that our industry can still function. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Casey. More to come as well, so stay tuned. And uh, again, everyone who's listening today, thank you uh, for joining us to uh, participate in today's AI Answers, weekly updates from the world's leading valuation authority. We will see you again next week. Casey, be well. We'll talk to you soon. Happy Fourth of July.